Back in the dark yet interesting days of early tank design, when nobody knew quite what a tank was supposed to look like, well, there were a couple of interesting ideas thrown out there. The Americans, of course, are realizing that, you know, this tank business is probably important. Let us go ahead and start building our own. And they had a look around, and they saw the big British heavy tanks, and they saw the, the much smaller French tanks, and they decided apparently that smaller is probably the way to go for now. And a program was started to create, actually originally it was a tractor, but then they decided, well, let's see if we can stick armor and a gun on it. And what they ended up with is this, the Special Tractor M1918, more commonly known as the Ford 3-ton. You never guess who made it. So if you look at what the vehicle is, it's basically, they looked at the FT design and they said, okay, let's just lop off the turret. But we'll keep some of the other good ideas. So they keep with the engine at the back, they keep with the large idler wheels at the front and the kind of triangular shaped suspension with a little bit of uh, tension up on the top from the springs. And well, they decided, well, let's put a machine gun on the side and see how it works. And they, the testers looked upon this and they said it was good. And they ordered something like 15,000 of the things. Well, no, there's only two of the 15 that were manufactured which are left. One is in Fort Benning and the other one is this one at the Ordnance Collection in Fort Lee, Virginia. And well, this is probably not going to take too long. Let's get started. So I'm going to start with the decidedly unsloped 5 eighths of an inch of armor on the left side, but the partially sloped 5 eighths of an inch of an armor in front of the driver. Of course, the reason they did this was that you had to leave room to mount the machine gun, which meant that you couldn't have the armor plate right in front of the gunner's face. The track links are extremely simple, again held in place by little cross pins, cast metal, I'm not even going to bother measuring them. They're small, but at least the vehicle only weighs three tons, so you don't need to be too wide to spread out the, uh, the weight. Solid disc idlers. Again, remember you had that difference between the M1917 and the FT. It depended on whether or not you had wood, idlers, or metal. Well, the three tons, they're all metal. Commander's cupola. And uh, there is a knob at the front that as you turn the knob, you can raise or lower the cupola on its hinge. So you can never really go beyond the open protected position, uh, but it gives you all sorts of more, a better uh, vision than just what you would get out of these slots. Then as you come further back, you're gonna see the two return rollers, which are on a leaf spring. And the idea behind this is uh, a, it's supposed to reduce a little bit of the vibration as the tracks are bouncing along on the top. And B, of course, these springs will add a little bit of tension to the track, but it's only an assistant. The main tension is performed, as you would expect, at the idlers. However, it looks a little difficult. So you can see these serrations here that the teeth mesh into, and okay, that holds the wheels in place once you have these two bolts pressing in and holding in it. Fantastic, the, the, the tension is not gonna get any less. The problem though is when you do decide you have to increase the tension, you undo the bolts, it loosens the idler, which is going to immediately flume backwards. That, that is a word, flume. And all I can think of is you gotta have a pry bar or something. Maybe you use the, uh, the towing loop uh, at the front to do it uh, and leverage forward again uh, because there's no cranking mechanism, there's no wrench or anything else to bring the tension upwards. So you're, you're pulling back, leveraging, leveraging until you get it to the right area, then you bolt down uh, the serrations to mesh with each other again and you are done. Fortunately, it's one of the lightest tracks, <laughs> at least metal tracks that, that were ever made on an armored vehicle. So it's, I guess it's not impossible, but it's not what I would like to do. Then you come around 
It starts getting a little bit more FT-like back here with the engine uh, and the hinge. I'll open it in a second. Now, when you come down to the suspension, you can see there are two three-wheel bogies. They are mounted on a leaf spring, which comes up here. So it is a sprung suspension, kind of, but it's not exactly a huge range of motion. Still, better than nothing. You can also see that the tracks are held on by flanges on the, on the idler and the road wheels. And of course, we get a couple of lifting hooks because it's got to get on a ship to go to Europe. Okay, opening up the engine deck is actually fairly simple. There are two bolts holding down the top lid. This covers the gap for the air. That there's a side. Now, this is where you kind of need a bit of a hand, but what, what happens is this comes up all the way, at which point you can then remove another bolt, pull this back, and you can see the inside of the engine compartment. I'm going to do this very carefully before it collapses down. There probably is an official way of doing it, but when you're in a museum, you gotta be careful. You know, like chucking it all the way forward to, to rest on the turret uh, or the cupola or something, maybe how they actually did it. This side, of course, also opens up if I felt like undoing the bolts, which I don't. And I'm sure the museum's happy I don't disassemble everything here. All right, so if you were to ask Ford in 1918, please build us mechanical vehicles that are rugged and reliable, Ford are gonna look at the power plant list and go, hmm, we have a four cylinder engine that is rugged and reliable. We've been building it since something like 1908 for 10 years, it's proven. It is the engine from the Ford Model T. Of course, it only puts out about 20 horsepower, which even though this is only three ton, it's a little bit light. So what they did was they simply put two Ford Model T's side by side. And they gave each one a transmission. So basically what happens is one engine and transmission runs each track. And the cooling system is linked. Uh, but the entire powertrain otherwise is completely independent. So all things considered, once you take the net effects of the mounting, the horsepower of the vehicle is somewhere around 30 to 35 and the top speed is all of eight miles an hour which in fairness compared to most other tanks of the time isn't all that bad not great but not all that bad uh, of course that does make uh, driving a little bit annoying sprocket at the back <laughs> very simply attached a single tooth sprocket as you can obviously see with a filler port for the lubrication around the back. The back, of course, is nice and simple. No tail lights or anything. So the air is brought in through the long slot up here, comes through the one radiator, and gets exhausted out the back. Two tailpipes, one for each engine. And of course, the question was asked, well, if we're going to send this to fight in World War I, where there are lots of trenches in Europe, what happens if this thing meets a gap more than six inches wide? And they decided that, well, like the FT, they needed to extend the trench crossing capability by use of a tail skid, nicely curved at the back, of course, because what's gonna, what's gonna happen when this thing crosses the trench, you can imagine, uh, it's going to basically just be dragging along the side in the hope that they get enough of a purchase at the front end that the tank can get out without flipping over onto its back. Occupational hazard of tanking back in the day, I guess. I shall now attempt to enter the Ford 3-ton, which may or may not be easier than it ordinarily would be because I happen to know that that seat is not bolted in place. 
So if it actually goes back that far, I couldn't tell you. Oops. Let's get this out of the way. Ow. Okay, that's not working. Let's try another, another technique. Um, okay, we'll try the machine gun side next. Oh, not good, not good. Well, I'm in. Okay, so now I'm in. And obviously this is not how you would drive because there is a big cupola up top, which is pretty good for me. But if I'm doing this, then you can't really see very much of me and you'll see kind of like bottom half, so I'll put my head down again. Now, as I put my left foot on the left brake, um, I'm clear of the armor panel. However, if I do that and I put my right foot on the accelerator, it's extremely close. Probably uh, only because the seat is unbolted and loosened. <laughs> yeah, what? It, there's probably a correlation there. Okay, so you will recall I had mentioned that there were uh, two engines and two transmissions. This makes doing a little bit interesting. So firstly, of the three pedals that I have down here, the two on the left are both brakes. One is a brake for the left track, one is a brake for the right track. Uh, and I guess in theory, I could put my foot on both of them at the same time and just bring the entire vehicle to a halt. Right hand side, well, that's the accelerator. That's not a problem. Now, the other thing is that there's four levers in here. So uh, there are two transmission levers and two steering levers. So the steering lever, lever seems to be just a, a bit of a, a clutch. And uh, if you're doing a casual turn, disengage the power and you'll do a, a casual turn around. Or if you want to make it slightly tighter, well, that's why you push down on the pedal for the appropriate brake. If you want to do a turn under power, what you can do is you can put one gear into first, the other one into second, and then you're going to do a powered turn with both uh, both tracks putting power forward which is actually kind of advanced for the time um, or if you wanted to do what is in effect a neutral turn you can put one in reverse put one into the uh, first forward and you'll do a spin on the spot not recommended you're supposed to just put one in neutral and then do the spin but it can be done uh, it's kind of a neat little feature for the time but you can imagine though the complications involved in steering by use of two pedals and four levers gets a little bit difficult. Probably a reason why I have not seen this configuration anywhere else. While I'm in here, you're going to see the socket for the hand starters. So the hand start, there is a hole in the front of the armor plate. You pass the, uh, the hand start uh, shaft all the way through, hooks into here, and then you can crank. Now there are electric starters as well. Although I don't actually see any controllers for them. Oh, actually, maybe this, is, this looks like the battery box. The fuel tank seems to be missing. Uh, so you go about 50 miles, give or take, on a single tank of fuel. Uh, but tracing the line from the carb, it comes to a valve here. It looks like a drain valve and it's a, a shut off. And it's not unusual for vehicles that are occasionally run. Obviously, this one has been run in, in a very long time from the warning signs. Uh, to have a detachable fuel tank just for the safety and ease of maintenance. Uh, if you leave a fuel tank unused for a particularly long amount of time, then it, it just, it's hassle that you don't need to deal with because you get all sorts of sediment. And uh, oftentimes also, especially in early fuel tanks, if there's rubber involved, the rubber will decompose. Uh, so a lot of times you'll just see somebody bring a jerry can, hook a jerry can in, that's what, uh, that will, what will run your, your tank. To close the front armor panel, 
and I'm not going to do it because I, th I think there's a reason it's it's up here. I tried it. Um, there is a safety lock, and then you can pull out. You pull you pull forward and then out. There we go, and it comes down. Uh, I'm just gonna put it back here. Again, it's one of those things that this is a really old tank, and I am not going to muck with uh, things all that much because I would like to be invited back and do more vehicles. Now, on the left-hand side is the gunner's position. He had in the production vehicles, uh, because it was uh, originally a prototype with a different gun, um, a Browning 1919 machine gun. Very simple mount on the left. Uh, there is an optic option on, on the far left. You can see the hole. And, well, that's about it. The this, this seat, of course, is not present. But if you look at the, the way the gun comes back, he, he has even less room than the driver does, really. Right. Um, I think that's it. I am going to get out. Okay, now getting out. I think feet first is probably going to be the way of doing this. I know this thing has been stuck here for however many months and years, but I still feel a little bit nervous about putting my hands where a hinge can get them. Still. Oh, out was much easier than in. Well, that's it. Short and simple for the Ford 3-ton. So, as I said, about 15,000 were originally planned to be built. Production stopped at 15. I guess they figured either A, the Germans were going to lose, so there's no point in building that many, or B, even the Americans figured out that this was not a vehicle worth pursuing. A couple did go as far as France, and there are photographs of it in testing with the French, and the French are looking at it kind of going... C'est terrible. Retour de les États-Unis. And so they did. Uh, they were sent back to the U.S. They stayed on the books for a while because, I mean, they were built. Why not still use them? But as an evolutionary concept, they were pretty much a dead end. Yes, in America, there was still the turretless Marmon Harrington that eventually showed up in the 1930s, but that was a very special case for the Marines and trying to get them on and off ships. That would be really, really like so, as ever, thank you to the Patreons or others who have financially supported me through PayPal or buying merchandise. It's cool merchandise. And, of course, to the Ordnance Collection, I am at the Ordnance's Training Support Facility in Fort Lee, Virginia. I'll talk to you on the next one. Take care.